you so much for joining us tonight. This looks like a usual history lecture series, thanks to no hurricanes. <laughs> I'm glad to have you all here. Um, my name is Michelle Miner. I'm the producer of the History Lecture Series. I want to welcome you all for tonight. Yeah, on to tonight's presentation. Um, tonight we have Mr. Greg Gagliano. He is an aficionado of, um, he's really passionate about this subject. It's awesome to hear him talk about it. Um, and I think you're going to enjoy this presentation that he's got for you tonight. He grew up in St. Bernard Parish. Um, he attended Holy Cross in Shanghai, High, went to um, UNO and Southeastern College Studies. He also did Delgado's Aviation Technology School, which could possibly bring us another lecture further down the line if we watch out for it. Um, he spent his youth time with his family vacations exploring forts and plantations and learning to metal detect and really honed his, his um, talents in his interest. And tonight's lecture is evidence of that. Um, he's got a wonderful presentation prepared for you with a lot of slides of historical information. Um, he did some archaeological studies in Europe and southeastern and southwestern United States. He did some underwater archaeology as well. But his main historical interests are the military, now all things colonial, and aviation, of course. Um, he did a very special thank you to all the people in the historical community. Mr. Bill Highland was one of those. Thank you for being here tonight as well. Ron Chapman, of course, our, our own, and he's here tonight as well. Um, and Curtis and myself, and that's greatly appreciated. But we're eager to get on to this presentation, so I will call it Mr. Greg Gagliano. Okay, the St. Bernard really has a long history. When you consider the uh, formation of the, uh, the Delta, and the surrounding delta, uh, and the Mississippi River, being that it changed courses several times over history, uh, one of the most uh, obvious remnants of that is what we know as the Gentilly and the Metairie Ridges. That's because at one time the Mississippi River had run through the middle of what would later become the city of New Orleans. And as it uh, changed its courses, it began depositing silt and began building up land, which formed the uh, St. Bernard Delta. But that area, not just is in St. Bernard, but it, it encompasses areas that are like along the south shore of Lake uh, Pontchartrain and the eastern shores of Lake Pontchartrain as well. So some of what I'm going to be talking about uh, this evening will be not just St. Bernard Parish, of course, but parts of uh, Orleans Parish of the eastern parts and the uh, southern parts along the shores of Pontchartrain. <clears throat> you can see the formation of the different deltas. And this one here, the Coquitry Delta, you can see it. Parts of all these parishes that formed between 3,500 and 4,500 years ago. Here, this area of the St. Bernard Delta, encompassing what we, you know, mostly know as the St. Bernard Parish here, was a little, you know, later in period. But it enabled people to start moving in from areas around here in Mississippi, parts of Louisiana, east of Baton Rouge. And as the land, of course, built up, more people started moving in and exploiting the uh, natural resources in the area. Um, the fishing was a main uh, uh, thing for these people and hunting. So they started moving into these areas. And about 1,000 to 2,800 years ago, the St. Bernard Delta had pretty much been you know, finished being completed. And the next slide shows us a little bit more. Right here in this area, and right back over here. In the Kokichu Delta, this contributed a lot to the buildup of the areas we know around New Orleans and, of course, here. And this is basically showing a, uh, a chronological and a stratigraphic, uh, showing the different layers 
like in an archaeological site that might be encountered. Some of the earliest, some of the earliest people that came into this area lived in the poverty point culture, and there's actually a couple of sites that were found during the um, construction of the Mississippi River Gulf Island. They found at least two sites within maybe a mile and a half or two miles of Paris Road that point to evidence that the Poly Point culture had, uh, had influenced. Now this culture came out of northeastern Louisiana, and that's a massive archaeological site, a very old, very old site. The Poverty Point culture goes back maybe three, four thousand five hundred years ago. And their influence came down the river. But mostly the Chifonta culture is very little of that is in St. Bernard, but some of it. The Marksville culture picks up a little bit more. There was more people and influence from this culture here. The Troyville, Coles Creek culture, and Plaquemine. The dates usually for the Marksville culture between 1800 and 2600 years ago, the Marksville culture, you're looking at about 1600 to 1900 years ago. The Troyville culture between 900 and about uh, 1600 years. And later on, the Plaquemine Mississippian cultures. Uh, between like 700, 900 years, and later the Mississippian culture. And that's about where tonight's lecture is going to stop. It's going to strictly be about the prehistoric people. Major sites in our area, the early sites, the Lindsay site, the Garcia site, uh, some of these sites can go back to between 3,600 and 4,000 years old. A little later on, we had sites. The main site, the Chifonta site, which is in nowadays, it's in Fountain Blue Park. It was along the shoreline. And in the 1930s, the um, WPA had excavated this site after human remains were found. And at the Chifonta site, they found about uh, 43 human burials and about 50,000 fragments of pottery there. Uh, it was a massive undertaking. They employed lots of people. And that was about 1934. They were probably excavating that. But Little Woods, near modern-day Lincoln Beach area, is another important site of the Chifonta culture. And also the site of Big Oak and Little Oak Island, which is further in the New Orleans East, south of the Interstate 10, way out in the marsh. And at the time that uh, these areas were being used, they were surrounded by, uh, there was a lot of water around there. The water had receded over the years. Um, in further, closer to us, we have sites on Magnolia Mound, Bayou La Lutra, Lake Bourne, southern shores of Lake Pontchartrain, and these sites all date back between 1800 to about 2600 years old. Lesser sites in St. Bernard are along Malado Bayou, Bottle Bayou, Bayou St. Malo, Shell Beach, Bayou Philippon, and an area known as Indian Mountain Lagoon. Now, some of the earliest people to develop pottery, ceramic pottery in Louisiana came around 300 BC. So we're talking about 2,300 years ago. It was the Chifonta culture. And this is a typical rendering of what their houses would have been. It would have been frame construction with palmetto fronds draped over them. And the Chifonta culture occupied very small villages, usually along bayous, along the intersection of where a bayou runs into a lake. It was very typical of them. Uh, there wasn't, uh, they were scattered around the areas. 
There's most of these occur on the eastern shores of Lake Pontchartrain and on the north shore, Mandeville, Bayou Lacombe, Bayou Cassine, and of course, as I mentioned, found Blue Park area that was major sites. And some of the sites uh, related to this culture are going to be located in eastern New Orleans. But they were the first culture to have the ceramic pottery. And when they would, um, when people would die, they would basically take the bodies and go drag them off to an area and let nature take over for decomposition, animals, ants, and all of that. And they would simply often take the the bones, the remains, after a couple of months of decomposition, and simply throw them onto uh, piles of shells, or sometimes bury them in the shells. Um, the clam shells, the Rangia clam, is a brackish water clam, and it became a very, very useful uh, form of food source. It wasn't a main food source, but it was a supplemental food source. These people harvested these clams by the millions from the shores and from the bottoms of the lakes. And the refuse, the, the empty clam shells were often piled up. And over hundreds of years, they accumulated and formed small levees or mounds. Uh, these people used this. It was basically a giant trash pit, is what it was. Uh, broken pottery was thrown into it, the middens. <coughs> bones of animals that were caught and eaten were thrown into there. And here's an image of a slightly larger, you know, gathering. You can see typical dwellings. They were kind of a round, conical shape, very simple. Uh, the hide stretched out to be scraped. The usage of a, like a little canal that was dug so the dugout canoes could be brought in. And um, dugout canoes were usually constructed by felling a tree and then removing the bark on one side and then building a fire to burn into the side of the tree to save time. They would use stone axes to carve out you know, the, the dugout, but they would usually light a fire to help burn it and that would speed up the process. And whenever they would receive, go down to a certain level, they would start cutting out more and more until finally the uh, shape of a basic dugout would emerge. Cane matting was used to lay down inside the dwellings for people to sleep on. It was used from uh, the southern cane was usually split and it was woven into very different patterns. Some people were more skillful than others. They could make it, you can see it. These are examples that were found in uh, southeastern Louisiana in the 1960s. And you can see different patterns that were used. Most of it was like just for general purposes. Um, sometimes the, uh, the matting was used outside, but normally it was used inside the dwellings for people to, to lay down on. Um, some specimens are really well preserved that have been found. It's amazing, you know, in the, in the soil, you would think that a lot of this stuff would rot away, but a lot of it, you know, really was well preserved. Palmetto fronds were also used to be woven together to be uh, made into matting. Um, that's another common. <coughs> Uh, usage of it. Seeds, nuts, roots, clams were very commonly uh, gathered and eaten. <coughs> during the winter time, these people, uh, besides hunting animals that were still around during the winter time, uh, they would store up during the, uh, the warmer months, they would store nuts and roots so they would have something to you know, subside on during the winter time. Later cultures had developed the use of maize, squash, beans, and gourds as agriculture developed. <coughs> For hunting, uh, large game at least, this shows 
a sphere, but this part right here is called an atlatl. A-T-L, A-T-L, it's an odd name, but an atlatl is like a shape like the letter J. It was hooked into the base of the sphere, and this stone here is a weight. And with somebody who was skillful in practice with it, this was thrown much more accurately with a lot more velocity than just simply holding a spear in your hand and throwing it. Um, the Adelaide dates back to probably 8,000 years ago. And it was very common and used all the way up until historic times, or at least until the advent of the bow and arrow, which was much later. But this gave the hunter an advantage that with practice, he could throw the spear with much more accuracy and much more speed, increasing the chances of you know getting your game. The, the most common game back then are the same kind of animals that we you know have here you know today: deer, bear, rabbit, muskrat, raccoon, um, opossum, dogs. By this time, all of the large animals, the bison. Camel, the mastodons had already disappeared thousands of years earlier, though some of their remains are found in parts of Louisiana. Um, smaller animals were usually caught in snares. They were also caught in nets. They were caught with a bola, which is a cord with uh, two rocks on the end of it that is thrown to entrap the rear legs of the animal and render them unable to move and thus make them easier to you know, kill. Um, so there was a lot of trapping that was going on. It was so much, this is mostly just for the larger game, but for smaller game, rabbits and all these, they were mostly caught in snares and in traps. The advent of the bow and arrow increased the hunting success greatly, but that's a little bit further on down. Um, for fishing, the fishing, the cord itself was made from vegetable fibers and very fine roots and very fine vines were plated together to make cords. Fish hooks were made from the toe bone of deer. They would, let's see, here we go. Here's a basic development of a fish hook showing the different stages of production, starting off with the basic toe bone of the deer being worked down to the basic. They utilize a lot of the, the deer, I mean, besides just the toe bones, the antlers were just about the strongest thing you could have to make a, a handle for a knife. So deer was, was very important and very much a part of their hunting. So they would use these, and you can see they would tie the cord right here and use that. Now fish were often caught in nets. They were often uh, speared with a harpoon, which I'm going to show you just in a minute. They were often driven into shallow water where they were able to be Part easier. They also had like a, something that we would know as like a frog gig, basically a type of stick formation with like a three or four prongs that was attached to the end of the spear, and that was used in shallow water for certain fish. Now the fish that they caught and used would be the same fish that we have, you know, nowadays. Lots of drum, lots of catfish, garfish. Now here's a harpoon that was actually found remnants of it that was found along the shores of Lake Pontchartrain in the 1970s or early 1980s. It shows the head that was made from a sharpened piece of deer antler or bone. This is the rest, the finger rest, the shaft, and the cord, which was made from fibers and roots woven together. And the skin, a bladder, usually they use the bladder of the animal tightly fill it with some air and use it to keep everything from floating away. But this is a very, for its time, this was a rather advanced item, um, but it was pretty commonly used. 
Um, certain fish, of course, that uh, were in deeper waters would, you know, have to be trapped by netting. But if any fish that was in shallow water, the harpoon, you know, seemed to serve its purpose. Now moving on, the Chifuncta culture is going to be the first one I'm going to talk about here. Little Oak Island and Big Oak Island were major sites. Big Oak Island was uh, made up almost entirely of clamshells. It was used as a processing station when um, fish and animals would be hunted or caught. They would be brought to Big Oak Island where they would be processed and brought to Little Oak Island, which is where the people live, this is where the village site was at. These sites were excavated around 1934, uh, starting with the WPA program. They use a lot of those guys for labor. And um, also in the 1980s, UNO, uh, Dr. Richard Schenkel, he did extensive uh, studies out there. And in the 1970s, actually, he started, but he, over the course of a few years, the summer archaeological program uh, brought a lot of the uh, students out there to excavate. Now this site is way deep in, in the marsh, but at the time when of its heyday, so to speak, it was uh, surrounded by water. Um, this culture did not uh, associate, when they buried people, there was no grave goods associated as when later times they would just simply bury the uh, bundles of bones. Uh, there wasn't any kind of ceremonial, you know, from what they've learned, there wasn't much of that. And they lived in small areas and they basically subsided off of uh, fish, clams. But it's unusual, you would think that all the crabs and crawfish in this area very little of that was used by these people. And this uh, archaeological uh, evidence has shown that it's, it's not because of uh, poor preservation of remains over the thousands of years. It's the fact that these people simply didn't exploit uh, the crabs and crawfish very much. Very little of these remains have ever been found in any of these archaeological sites. Um, often when we have a lot of uh, deer and larger game, uh, there's not much use to exploit small things like you would think like clams. The clams were always there. They were something that the people could always fall back upon in times when food was getting kind of short. But uh, for some reason, they just didn't seem to exploit the use of crabs and uh, crawfish. Oysters were, uh, but oysters were a little harder to break open than clams, as you would imagine. But uh, oysters were definitely used by these people. Uh, there's very little of uh, Chifuncta sites in St. Bernard. Some of them have been found, but they were found during uh, construction, also during the construction of the uh, Mississippi River Gulf Island. They did find some Chifuncta remains uh, about maybe a mile or two from Paris Road during the digging of that. But most of the uh, Chifuncta culture is centered in eastern New Orleans and, of course, along the North Shore and through other parts of Louisiana. Big Oak and Little Oak Island, as I had mentioned, look, this is made up in almost entirely of clam shells. And this center here is where they found many human burials. And down here, um, it was like a, like a crab claw shaped midden. And Little Oak Island is where the people mostly lived. At. It was maybe about a half a mile from Big Oak Island. And when the archaeologists went here in the 1970s, they were finding also a lot of human burials, but um, pottery shards, uh, broken 
spear points, knife blades. But here was mostly where the hunters and the fishermen would gather during the seasons and process the meat, the clam, to be brought over to the uh, other village site. After the Chicago culture started to um, lose, I guess you'd say, uh, influence, a culture known as the Marksville began to emerge. And the Marksville culture began to emerge during a time when there was a lot of contact with people coming down the Mississippi River out of the Ohio and the river valleys of Illinois as well. Marksville culture was very, very advanced compared to what the cultures were in southern Louisiana. Uh, the Marksville people had contact with the uh, Hopewell culture coming out of Illinois and Ohio. Uh, these people were very much into a new style of uh, life. Um, their lifestyles would be um, centered around uh, ceremony, uh, religious ceremonial areas, a large plaza surrounded by mounds with houses built on the top of it. They practiced um, a lot of, uh, when people were buried, they would be buried with grave goods, uh, pottery that was made especially for being buried, stone spear points that were to be interred with the deceased. Um, and they had established uh, levels of uh, hierarchy. Uh, the important people would be given all kinds of elaborate ceremony when they died. Um, this influenced the Marksville people. Uh, in the early stage, the Marksville was kind of like a holdover from the Chifonto, kind of simple at first, but later it evolved into a little bit more complex. Their pottery became a little bit more, uh, if you would call it, fancier. Um, they took on different shapes and different designs. Uh, they also, um, the Marsville culture also started trading uh, long distance with these people up the Mississippi River. They started obtaining uh, freshwater pearls, uh, different types of rocks that weren't available around here. And uh, a lot of these products were made by the uh, Hopewell culture up north and simply uh, traded to the people down here. This is a mound that was excavated in the 1930s in southern Louisiana by the WPA also. And you can see the height of this thing. This is mostly shell and dirt. And this one here, part of the same thing, you can see the men working down here. Uh, a lot of these mounds were just really huge. Um, they were built along the shores of lakes. Um, and over hundreds of years, the amount of clams just you know, accumulated to where you just had like, these very, very, very large mounds. Copper was imported from up north uh, for the first time during this period. Hematite, which was a very uh, shiny dark rock that was used for ornaments, medallions, and decorations. Uh, the Marksville people were also pretty much about the first people to utilize the use of maize. Um, that's one of the things that they uh, passed on to the people down here. Uh, earlier people in Louisiana had domesticated squash and gourds, but uh, the usage of maize and growing of that was a a step in the right direction, so to speak, for these people, because it gave them a lot of um, food sources during times when it might be kind of hard to find. Um, the Marksville sites were usually on high ground. They were near rivers, uh, floodplain lakes, and natural levees. Here's another one showing a cutaway view. This is a dirt mine. You can see the height of this. These are states that were plotted out to show different areas that would be excavated in the future, but you can tell by the, the depth of this. 
the size of these things. I mean, after hundreds of years accumulating dirt, debris, and shells, a lot of these mounds became really huge. And they were, in later years, they were often dug into for people to use for driveways and roads and all of that. And that's what led to a lot of the discoveries of a lot of these sites. Uh, some of the places in St. Bernard and um, Eastern New Orleans in the 30s when um, people were, you know, mining, so to speak, these huge uh, shell piles, they started finding human skulls and bones and <coughs> broken pottery and uh, stone points. And, you know, luckily, you know, they had the good common sense to notify the local archaeological departments at, you know, Tulane and LSU in those days. And they began these excavations, and that's how we, you know, started learning about a lot of this. This one here, on the right hand side, this is a a, a midden that is out in uh, the marsh of Saint Bernard. This picture was taken in the 1970s, or at least showing what was left of a uh, midden. And often, uh, in the middle of the marsh, you might see a lot of these, uh, like a you might want to call it a small forest of trees that will be growing. They're growing off of the high ground, and that's what kind of tip off some people that there's something there other than just, you know, just the marsh, because uh, especially oak trees, they only grow when you have a lot of uh, uh, earth and soil to support them. This one would have been from the uh, Marksville and the later uh, Troyville culture which began just uh, a few years after the Marxville culture started losing influence. Uh, people started uh, establishing larger villages. They started building mounds, and on top of the mounds, they built homes for the uh, hierarchy, you know, the people more important. Uh, around these places, smaller villages sprung up. This one shows, this picture was taken around 1972. In St. Bernard Parish, you can see here was a large mound here and here, whatever you see the trees. But by this time, of course, the water had inundated these areas and um, the marshes had grown up. But during the time, this would have been all solid land with a lot of trees around them. And here's another one. You can see here with the trees, it's a typical example. Here's a marsh and here's a bunch of trees growing. That's usually a good giveaway that it's an Indian mound. These pictures I took out in Lake Bourne around 1992 or 93. Uh, this is a large Troyville and also uh, a Marksville and Plaquemine site here. You can see the trees growing, and this is like along the shoreline, and at the time, you see all these dead trees here? This was all solid land, as you would imagine, and it went out into the lake. Um, and that's what kind of tipped me off when I first saw this site. I saw all these dead trees, and uh, I brought the boat around and started going ashore, and you know, immediately started finding pieces of uh, bone and Indian pottery. And, and you can see all the shells here, the clam shells. Even after hundreds and hundreds of years, they're still there. And the lake is just eaten away. Um, this large village site was probably at one time about a mile back from the shoreline. But as over the years, you know, as we all know, as water, you know, has eroded away so much of our shoreline, this is what was left probably in the 1990s. Now, I haven't actually been to this site since 2004, but this is pretty much what it looked like then. Back here is a very intact shell, and you can see this line here is kind of light. That's all the clam shells. It's like a levee about six to seven, eight feet high, and about 20 feet to 30 feet across in places. And here's some more pictures showing the extent of the shells going further inland. And here's the larger mound further in the back. And you can see where I'm kneeling at, all of the shells around 
It's just like hundreds and hundreds of feet. And over the years, storms have leveled it off. But this was a very large village site in Lake Bourne, a very large site. This is a photograph of a very intact shell midden, which is in the shape of like a levee. And you can see the trees growing off of it. This is about what you're looking at right here. That one. As far as excavations go, this is a typical site that would have been excavated along the bayou in the St. Bernard area, Orleans area, probably in the 1980s. Uh, you can see they have the sifters, any artifacts and dirt, clamshells that come out of here, go into here, and this guy, he's operating like a hose. And here's the pump that's drawing the water out of the excavation pit, and also it provides water like a hose to wash off the artifacts so you can see what they're finding here. Um, this, I believe, is along Bayou, <coughs> Bayou, maybe Bayou Wolutra, perhaps. And it's just like probably about six feet deep in excavation pit. Now this one here is a core drill. It drills straight down to the ground and takes basically a core sample so archaeologists can find out what they're dealing with to see how far down the um, debris, the shells, and the dirt goes to. Uh, this picture was taken in the 1980s at a bayou, probably um, just north of St. Bernard. This is basically showing when archaeologists go to a site, when they begin the test pit, they dig down in increments of six inches at a time. Uh, Usually, uh, they call it a unit. It's about a five foot by five foot square that they begin. And they'll go down six inches at a time. They'll record whatever they find. They take all of the debris, put it into buckets, and dump it into the sifters. And whenever you see dark soil like this, that's an indication of a human habitation. Uh, lighter soils nearby, when you're looking at like different levels, the lighter soil could sometimes indicate areas that hadn't been used as much. Um, this picture was taken around 1998. Um, it shows like a typical beginning of a typical test area. And here we're progressing a little further down. Um, they'll open up one every so many feet just to get an idea to test the site and see what's going to be there. And as they go deeper into an area like this, like a trench, these holes indicate sites that was probably a post, like for a dwelling, um, the frame of a uh, Indian dwelling. Um, they also look at all the dark spots. Uh, they show up because of a human uh, usage, you have a decaying organic material, you have fire pits that darken the soil, um, you have even the sweat off of people's bodies over decades on a certain level, and it starts to darken the soil, but uh, a lot of it is um, deteriorating fat and uh, animal remains that go into the soil that darkens it. So what archaeologists look for, the darker the soil is usually an indication of human uh, habitation. Uh, lighter soils uh, will often show that a period of um, either less usage or no usage at all. And in the sifters, it's a very tedious progress. I mean, they'll put shovelfuls of dirt into buckets and dump the buckets into these sifters. And people sit there and they run water over there and they'll pull out the little rocks, pieces of clams or shells, and then they'll look for pottery or fragments of stone that have been chipped to indicate um, spear points, uh, arrowheads, knife blades. So it's a very lengthy, very, very tedious process. And uh, I was able to participate with the University of Alabama and Orbit University. 1990s, uh, 1998, 1999, 
on a few of their summer programs that they offer to the general public. This one shows in Louisiana, in southern uh, Louisiana, a very deep Indian bin that has been digging on, into by the archaeologists. Um, this is a good example of stratigraphy, the study of stratigraphic layers. And you can tell um, the different layers will yield uh, information about maybe what culture of people had lived there first, starting with the lotus levels. Uh, they can tell by the types of uh, pottery that they find, the shapes of the uh, stone objects, or whether or not there is no pottery. Uh, pottery, like I said, doesn't come into um, use in Louisiana until around 2,300 years ago. So when they go to a site and there's no pottery and they're finding a lot of the uh, older stone items, they know that this is a site that predates the use of pottery. This picture was taken in 1977. And it's just showing, you can barely see different layers. But to give you an idea of the accumulation of shells and dirt over the centuries of people living at one certain site, it's what you know archaeologists really look for. So when you're digging your test pits, you have to keep the walls very straight. It's called a profile. You, you got to keep that very straight and level, so that the most information can be you know taken from that particular area. And we're going to go on to actual artifacts that have been found at these places. These are from the Chifunta culture, and. Uh, like I said, about 2,300 years ago, they were about the first people in Louisiana to use clay pottery. Uh, the first pottery in Louisiana comes out of Poverty Point, northeastern Louisiana, but that was made from steatite or soapstone, and the bowls that they used had to be actually carved from a fairly carvable type of rock. Uh, soapstone or steatite is somewhat soft, if you want to call it that, and it's um, carvable with skill and time and patience. You can use it. But Chifunta culture in southeastern Louisiana was the first people to use clay pottery. And these are just like typical designs of it. You have dots, you have little dashes, angled lines. This is all very typical. This is one of the very few actual intact bowls that was ever recovered from a Chifunta site. And even that had to be glued back together from fragments. Down here we have pieces of bone that were used actually for, um, for pipes. They actually used that to, to smoke from. Big clay objects, these were used for cooking. Um, the Poppy Point people had often developed a uh, simple round uh, lump of clay that was uh, heated and baked. And the way the people had cooked their food in the, uh, prehistoric times was simply a pit was dug, a shallow pit, a fire was started, the round or square balls of clay that had been baked were used like we would use charcoal briquettes nowadays. The pit was uh, the fire was uh, removed from the pit, leaving the, the pit very hot. Wet grass was laid down in the bottom of the pit, and on top of the wet grass, these uh, very hot round balls of clay were laid down, and on top of that, the meat, the fish or the deer, whatever you were cooking, was laid on top of that. More uh, very hot clay balls were laid on top of that, and that was covered over with grass and then covered with dirt. And in a couple of hours you had, you know, your food was cooked. That's the most common way that these people had cooked. Uh, fires were started by uh, means with uh, chipping flint against flint. Uh, and also the, uh, what's called the bow drill method. It's simply a, a stick, a miniature bow with cord that was wrapped around a, uh, a wooden shaft placed on top of a flat piece of wood and you would go back and forth 
you would put a piece of rock or bait clay on your hand to protect your palm, lay the shaft of the uh, wood, and have this little bow wrapped around it. You would do that back and forth until finally you got, you know, the wood would start heating up. Uh, the quickest way was, of course, using pieces of flint that were struck together, emanating sparks onto um, pieces of kindling, little small slivers of wood. Um, and often when these people got fires started, they kept them up 24 hours. They would just keep feeding the fire just to keep it going. And of course, when it rained, well, they would have to start the process over again. But they got really good at all this. And once you do it day in and day out, I mean, you really, you know, you get it down. And here's some more pieces. These were found at the Littlewood site in eastern uh, New Orleans in the 1930s showing some of the typical designs of the Chifonta culture. Dots, dashes, squiggly lines, this was all typical. These are pieces from the bottoms of the vessels that had like, a, you would call it footed. So when they would put it uh, to heat something up over a fire, it would kind of um, help, you know, heat the bowl up. This is a couple of pieces of the Arrangia clam, which compromises so many tons of some of these middens that they use oyster shells. Um, these are all fragments of bone that have been sharpened to be used as uh, to, to puncture the leather to be used for sewing, kind of like a needle that it would be used nowadays. Uh, often deer bone was used, but any kind of bone could be used in a pinch. And here's the typical spear points of the time period shown that they had recovered. Here's a little bit better to look at some of the uh, Chifonte culture spear points. And I'm lobby here, as you've seen, I've got a few of these like typical examples on display. Here's a knife. The larger ones were typically knives, but at this time, most of the large game had already disappeared from the area. The horses, the camel, the large bison, um, mastodons had way disappeared thousands of years earlier. So deer and some bear were the, the largest that, you know, that they had hunted at that time. These are small spear points that were thrown uh, with the use of the antelope. These are uh, chopping uh, stones used to hollow out uh, wood. They were used to um, just anything that they used to, to cut. Here's another knife example. These over here are uh, bone antler uh, used for like as a needle. These here, pretty much the same thing. Anything that they needed to puncture leather. Here's one that had a hole drilled in it that was used as a needle with cord made from vegetation and very small line, fish hook, canine teeth, pendants. Uh, these people often wore a lot of these things around their necks and around their wrists, around their ankles. Um, as time progressed, people got a little bit more and more into ornamentation. Um, here's one of the very few, not even not a complete bowl, but it's from the Chifonta culture that was found out at Littlewood's site. Glued back together, you can see the feet I was just describing. It's kind of like a flat sided with like a flared square lip on it. Now moving into this other area here, these are bowls that came from the Marksville culture, which came out of the Chifonte. And you can see their designs are a little bit different. They use uh, snake designs, squiggly lines, circular designs. Uh, things sort of get a little bit fancier, if you want to call it, by the Marksville period. And some of these were made uh, to be buried with dead people. They were, some of them were strictly made, you know, for, to be associated with the uh, internment of people. 
a lot of these things were just simple utilitarian, what you would use every day for storing food in. But um, this culture was one of their uh, traits was that with the uh, associated with burying people, they would make fancy bowls just for that occasion. Here's a few of the designs, and you can see it's quite different than the Chifonka. There's a little bit more ornate patterns, different lines, curves. Um, some things took on the shape of birds, lizards, or animals and things. A little bit fancier, curved. These two are smoking pipes that were developed by the Marxville culture. Most of these things at first were traded with the uh, people of the Hopewell culture coming out of uh, the Illinois and the Ohio River valleys. And that influenced uh, the people down here to start developing their own. But often a lot of that culture was based on what they learned from, uh, if you want to call it a slightly more advanced culture, coming out of the, the northern part, coming down the Mississippi River. These were all found in uh, southern Louisiana and southeastern Louisiana in the 1970s. Uh, a lot of Marksville spear points and knife blades were very similar to their predecessors. Um, as the larger game decreased, uh, spear points also decreased in size. These are scrapers and choppers down here for digging out wood. Um, these mostly, these here, projectile points for the spears. Basically a lot of this is examples of what I actually have from original examples in the lobby and display. This is just later cultures, the styles that they have proceeded to. As time grew on, they get more and more elaborate. Uh, they were, some, of these could, some of these could be about that big round. Oh. A lot of them are like beakers, mug shaped. Some of these, like that, with rather small cups, mugs. But it's amazing. You know, I mean, the archaeologists have found these things intact, and mostly the, all these things were found in, in graves. Most all of them. Um, these people just didn't bury in you know, an intact vessel like in a trash pit. It was mostly all associated with people that were being buried. And here, a human head, head form. This is actually the form of a bird with the wings swept back. These are of a later period, the Mississippian culture, which uh, lasted until about the time of contact with the Europeans around 1700 in southern Louisiana. But a lot of them were plain, just usage to be used for storage and cooking. In. But it's, you know, it's amazing what they, you know, what they have found through that. But um, if they've any, any questions, I could maybe you know answer. Yes, thank you. How do they make the holes? The holes? You mean for the when it was sewn leather or for yeah, you showed the pictures of the, the hooks and some of the hooks. The, 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 the hooks. Yeah, how did they make no, the hooks? They, the they would take they would start with the uh, the toe bone of a deer usually and they would go to that part of the bone that was naturally almost shaped like that and they would start working that away with a stone, a very uh, fine and sharp stone knife. They would start carving away at it, working at it. And after a few hours, they would eventually emerge with the hook shank. It took a lot of practice. I but think it, they're asking how they drilled the holes and the hooks. The drill the holes and hooks? That was used by a very, very fine, what they call a drill. It was a very fine worked stone point. They had drills back? They used it. They used it. Drills. They used. They took stone and they worked it down very fine. I mean, you know, when you practice it day in and day out, because they didn't have anything else to do but hunt and fish. At least the men, you know, that did that. You would get pretty good at it. But they would use a 
work stones down very fine. And for very, very fine work, they would use sharpened pieces of deer antler, because that's like stronger than you know any kind of regular bone. So deer antler was used a lot. That was used uh, to make needles and you know. And they were just holes. Like, twisting it, or they had for the holes. Yeah. They would yes, ma'am. They would work it like that wow. until eventually. You work into the bone, and you got your very fine hole. You flip it over to the other side, and work it in from the other side as well. So I'm sure they probably broke a lot of them in practicing, but once you got really good at it, you get it. Yeah. What about it's, beads, Greg? Now they use and all. Yeah. They use uh, what you would call exotic stones, hematite, um, magnetite. These things came from up north. They would use uh, freshwater pearls. They would also use a clay that they would simply make into little balls and puncture a hole in it before it was baked. Um, it's traded with other people from surrounding areas where stone was uh, more prevalent. They would start obtaining these stones and making into necklaces and all of that. And a lot of that was used in burials as well. They would make elaborate necklaces to bury with someone. Thank you.